good evening and very much welcome to this debate tonight. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you have come tonight. I was told that we are now 600 people here, which is quite a bit. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here and our question tonight is, does God exist? It hardly gets any bigger than that. It is also my great pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, at my left, I have uh, Professor William Lane Craig, a research professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology in uh, La Mirada in California in the United States. He earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham in England before taking a doctorate in theology uh, from the University of Munich in Germany. I promised also to mention that he has published a lot of books and articles and many of his articles are ava available online at www.reasonablefaith.org. So I'm sure you can get this address if you didn't get it right now, you can get it later on also. Also, it is a great pleasure to welcome uh, Associate Professor Clemens Kabel. Uh, he is a, an MA in medicine, an MA in philosophy. He has a PhD in philosophy, and he's an Associate philo Professor in philosophy at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, also, I would mention that he's a former member of the Danish Council of Ethics, an, a council that takes up many uh, crucial issues and debates. Thank you and welcome to both our guest speakers. <laughs> I appreciate very much your warm welcome. I would like to mention, however, that under the debate, we appreciate very much uh, if you keep silent so that everyone can hear. It's, I'm told that the loudspeakers are not that good uh, on, on the upper level, so please be silent. Also, we would like you to not uh, give any uh, booing or comments on what's being said. Um, <clears throat> we have a plan for the evening, uh, a schedule, so to speak. First, each speaker will give his presentation, which lasts 20 minutes. Uh, then uh, there's a, a rebuttal, uh, of, which will last about 12 minutes. Uh, and uh, we have a second rebuttal of eight minutes. And then each uh, speaker gets five minutes for a closing uh, statement. And now you may ask, what about us? Don't we get to say anything? Yes, you do. There will be a... Um, a possibility of uh, coming forward, uh, giving questions to our speakers uh, after we have a, a coffee break. We expect this whole session to last till about uh, 10 o'clock tonight, uh, and the coffee break is expected to be around uh, 9.30. But there is a, a uh, we want this debate to be fair, so we have uh, given each speaker a, a certain amount of time, so we, we really get a fair debate tonight. And I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, William Craig, firstly. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. Let me begin by thanking our hosts for inviting me to participate in this debate tonight. And I also want to see how grateful I am to Dr. Koppel for his willingness to join in the discussion. Now, the question before us this evening is, does God exist? The question then is, which worldview is more plausibly true, atheism or theism? I'm going to defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. One, there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true. <laughs> 
And two, there are good reasons to think that theism is true. Now, with respect to that first contention, I'll leave it up to Professor Koppel to present his arguments for atheism before I respond to them. But I do want to say something in advance here. In his published work, Dr. Koppel has criticized agnostics as being too timid. He says, there is no reason to be agnostic about the existence of God. We know that God does not exist. Now, to justify this bold claim, the atheist must do more than simply say there's no evidence for God. For that claim is compatible with agnosticism. The absence of evidence for something does not prove that that thing does not exist. For example, many cosmologists have speculated that there may be other universes which together with our universe make up a kind of multiverse. Now we have no evidence yet of the existence of other universes, but that obviously doesn't mean that they therefore don't exist. Something may exist even if we have no evidence for it. So if Professor Koppel is to move beyond agnosticism to atheism, he needs to give us some positive arguments for atheism. Now, in defense of my second contention, I want to sketch briefly some reasons in favor of God's existence. I was intrigued that in an article in Politiken in September of 2010, Professor Koppel says that there are three types of consideration that could constitute evidence for God's existence. One, logical proofs or philosophical arguments. Two, inference to the best explanation. This is the type of evidence that justifies evolutionary theory, for example. And three, testimonial evidence. This is the sort of evidence that plays a role in historical studies. Now, I found this interesting because I'm convinced that we have evidence of each sort for God's existence. Let's look briefly at some examples. First, philosophical arguments. The cosmological argument of the great German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz is a good example. According to Leibniz, the most fundamental question of philosophy is why is there something rather than nothing? Even if the universe is eternal in the past, we could still ask why there is an eternal universe instead of no universe at all. I can't think of any contemporary philosopher or physicist who thinks that the universe exists necessarily, for it's easy to conceive of a possible world in which a different collection of fundamental particles or fundamental fields exists, or even no particles or no fields at all. The universe does not therefore exist necessarily, but contingently. But if the universe exists contingently, then the obvious question arises, why? Why is this contingency realized when it doesn't have to exist? The explanation of why the universe exists can be found only in a transcendent reality which exists by a necessity of its own nature. Now there are only two possible candidates that could fit such a description. Either an abstract object like a number or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, even if it exists, has no effect on anything. It follows logically that the explanation of the existence of the universe is an unembodied mind, which is what theists take God to be. If you ask, why does God exist? The answer is that God, like numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects, exists by a necessity of his own nature if he exists. That cannot be said of the contingent universe. We can summarize Leibniz's argument as follows. One, every contingent entity has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Three, the universe is a contingent entity. Four, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence. Five, 
Therefore, the explanation of the existence of the universe is God. Now, I'm not claiming that Leibniz's argument is a knockdown proof of God's existence, but I do think that each of its three premises is more plausibly true than not, and therefore this gives us good evidence for God's existence. As Professor Koppel has written, by evidence, I mean observations or theoretical considerations that point us in the direction of the existence of God. Evidence does not have to be conclusive, end quote. Leibniz's argument certainly rises to that standard. There are also other philosophical arguments that are worth discussing here, such as the moral argument and the ontological argument, but in the interests of time, let's press on to the second sort of evidence, inference to the best explanation. In inference to the best explanation, we begin with a body of facts to be explained. We then assemble a pool of live explanatory options to account for these facts. Finally, we select that explanation which, if true, would best explain the facts in question. An excellent example of a theistic inference to the best explanation is the argument from the fine tuning of the universe. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are incomprehensibly more probable than any life-permitting universe. Now, there are three live explanatory options for this extraordinary fine-tuning, physical necessity, chance, or design. Physical necessity is not, however, a plausible explanation because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. Therefore, they are not physically necessary. So, maybe the fine-tuning is due to chance. Well, the problem with this explanation is that the odds of a life-permitting universe governed by our laws of nature are just so infinitesimal that they cannot be reasonably faced. Therefore, in order to rescue the hypothesis of chance, theorists have been forced to postulate the existence of a world ensemble of other universes, preferably infinite in number and randomly ordered so that life-permitting universes would appear by chance somewhere in the ensemble. Not only is this hypothesis, to borrow Richard Dawkins' phrase, an unparsimonious extravagance, but it also faces an insuperable objection. By far, most of the observable universes in a world ensemble would be worlds in which a single brain fluctuates into existence out of the vacuum and observes its world. Thus, if our world were just a random member of a world ensemble, we ought to be having observations like that. Since we don't, that strongly disconfirms the hypothesis of the existence of a world ensemble. So chance is not a good explanation. Design, then, seems to be the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe. There is an intelligent mind behind the cosmos 
which designed it to be life permitting. Hence, we may formulate the following inductive argument. One, the universe is fine-tuned for intelligent, interactive life. Two, the fine-tuning is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Three, the best explanation is design, for therefore a transcendent designer of the universe exists. Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe constitutes evidence for God. Another example of a theistic inference to the best explanation is based on the fact of the origin of the universe. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning, a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the existence of the universe. But the borg guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state of the early universe, which some scientific popularizations have misleadingly and inaccurately referred to as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. Of course, highly speculative scenarios such as loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. These models are fraught with problems, but the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeed in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. At a conference earlier this year, on the occasion of Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday, Vilenkin summed up the situation with these words, and I quote, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning, end quote. Now, it's difficult to see how there can be any explanation of this fact apart from theism. The only alternative to theism seems to be that the universe just came into being uncaused from nothing. But that just is to admit that there is no explanation of the origin of the universe. There just doesn't seem to be any competing hypothesis to theism available to the atheist to explain the origin of the universe. Hence, one may present the following inference. One, the universe had an absolute beginning in the past. Two, the best explanation of the absolute beginning of the universe is a transcendent creator. Three, therefore a transcendent creator exists. So once more, we have evidence for God in the form of an inference to the best explanation. Finally, what about that third sort of evidence? Testimonial evidence. Here, the Christian theist might appeal to the historical testimony to Jesus of Nazareth. Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, 
I realize that most people think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in, by faith or not. But in fact, there are actually three facts which are recognized by the majority of historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent German critic, Gott Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, and I quote, that is why as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him, end quote. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument uh, for the existence of God based on historical testimony to the facts concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And if we could have the final two points up there, three and four, that would complete the uh, inductive argument for the existence of God based upon the resurrection of Jesus. Now, much, much more de deserves to be said about these matters. But in the brief time allotted to me this evening, I hope to have shown at least that theism is far from bereft of evidence. On the contrary, we have evidence of every sort in favor of theism, philosophical arguments, inferences to the best explanation, testimonial evidence. If Professor Koppel wants us to believe atheism instead, then he must first tear down all of the evidence that I've presented for theism, and then in its place, erect a positive case of his own to show that atheism is true. Unless and until he does that, I think that theism is the more rational worldview. Thank you very much, Professor Craig. And now I'll give the floor to Clement Cabell, who's also a member of Atheistic, Atheistic Society. I guess I forgot to say that, but you probably guessed. Well, I'm, I'm glad you didn't say it. Because... <laughs> well, thanks everyone for, for coming and thanks for your <laughs> very interesting talk. Um, and thanks for not saying that I'm a member of the Atheistic Society, because I'm not. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Well, maybe I should be a sort of kind of honorary member, but actually I'm not even a member. Um, 
I should say that, um, well, actually I have a question to the audience before we start. It's, it's, it's always quite difficult to talk to an audience if you don't know what kind of audience you're talking to. And so could we, by a sort of show of hands, get some impression of how many people are theists here? Okay, I thought so. <laughs> and um, okay, I think I want to ask how many people are, are, are atheists? Maybe they don't want to show their hands now that they have realized they're in such a minority. Okay, okay, anyway. That's, yeah, you might be agnostic. There might be agnostics around, but uh, there'll probably be a few in number. Okay, so what I want to do is explain this position, how can believing that God does not exist be a reasonable position to have? And it's actually the position, the kind of position that, that uh, Craig uh, outlined. So I want to start just with some terminology. By God here, I mean a psychological being which exists outside the causal order, maybe even outside time and space, and who nonetheless has the willingness and the capacity to intervene in our earthly affairs, and who might be the originator of, of, the, of, the, of the universe, of human beings, of moral laws, and so on. That's what I take the word God to mean here. Other people use the word God in different ways, but I don't, and I don't think you did. So atheism is the view that such a God doesn't exist. God under this definition doesn't exist. And an atheist, of course, is someone who believes that God doesn't exist. And, uh, but as, as, as mentioned, I think there's a stronger view, a slightly stronger view, which is worth considering and which I've defended, which is the view that we actually know that God doesn't exist, or rather, many of us knows that, or know that. Or we are in a position to know that. It's not that all of us know it, because some obviously believe that God does exist, or they don't know that God doesn't exist. But those who don't believe that God exists for the right kind of reasons are in a position to know this. And if this strikes you as completely incredible and implausible view, then think about the belief that Tor doesn't exist. Tor is one of our local gods here. <laughs> I don't believe he exists. I, and neither do you. I don't believe he ever existed. It's not that, that he just died a thousand years ago. He never existed. I, I take myself not only to believe that he didn't exist, but also actually to know that he didn't exist. In just the same way, I take myself to know that God doesn't exist, or that Aphrodite doesn't exist, or that thousands and thousands of gods and our holy beings being mentioned in various scriptures and traditions, they don't exist. Okay. Now... What I will do now is explain my view about atheism and the stronger view that we know that God does not exist. What I won't do is attempt to convince a firm believer that he or she is wrong. I won't do it uh, in part because it, I can't do it in this time, but also in part because I think it's not worth doing, it's, it's not important to do. Also, I don't want to present a Kogan argument for, to a firm believer for the non-existence of God. So I don't want to argue or prove it. And by a Kogan argument, I here mean a set of premises and inferences that rationally ought to be accepted by a firm believer and which entails the non-existence of, of God. I don't think that it's easy to come up with such an argument because it's not easy to find the set of premises that ought to be accept, accepted by a firm believer. So I don't even want to respond to every argument and counter-argument and counter-argument to counter-arguments that a firm believer might make or will make. I actually have made some of them already. I don't want to respond to them. It's not that I think one shouldn't respond. It's just that this is just not the talk I prepared when I accepted to, to, to join this debate. I said that I would present my view, but I didn't necessarily want to uh, engage in all the details. In, in your view, it's not that I don't think they deserve being discussed, but it's just not what I had the time to do at this stage. Okay, so this is what I want to do. Okay, so as you all know, uh, I think you know at least, or, or agree with me about, in the vast majority of cases, the reasons that people believe that God exists has actually very little to do with considering purported evidence for God's existence. That's not the reason why they believe in God. 
Rather, the reason they believe in God has a lot to do with their upbringing and with the belonging to a community, a form of life that gives sense and meaning and direction to their lives. That's, that's the psychological reason why people believe in God. But of course, even, even though it's so, then there are traditional sources of evidence being cited in support of the hypothesis that God exists, and we have already talked about it. Um, I take sort of, I think there are three general classes of evidence. You might sort of divide the classes differently, but that's, that's not really important. But there are, I think there are these three, three kinds of evidence for the hypothesis that God exists, or the God hypothesis. One is, and we heard about it just a moment ago, so one is inference due to the best explanation of everything. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there evolution? Why does man exist? Why did various events happen? Why did the tsunami happen? Why, why did the earthquake in Turkey happen? And so on. Or morality, why is there something which is morally right and the other things which are not morally right? Historically, God has been cited as the best explanation of these things. Then there are testimony, individuals or scriptures, a tradition, they testify to the existence of God. And then there are logical or a priori philosophical proofs from apparently intuitive ontological principles, principles regarding sort of the very basic nature of, uh, of what, what the world must be like. And for example, the principle that every event must have a, an explanation of some sort, which means that you sort of need to go back to something which explains or causes, but which is not itself caused, and so on. Our modal principles, I'll, 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 I'll get back to that. So these are the kinds of evidence for God's existence that has been proposed in the theological and philosophical tr tradition. Now, sort of from my point of view, the question arises, how seriously should we take these sources of evidence for the God hy hypothesis? Actually, in my view, we shouldn't take them very seriously. And the reason why is, this is going to be a matter of, of controversy, but the, the reason why I think we shouldn't take them too seriously is that we should consider the God hypothesis, the hypothesis that God exists, as a kind of alternative hypothesis to much of what we take ourselves to know from science or common sense about the world. So we have this uh, hugely, nowadays, this was not the case 200 or 400 or 1,000 years ago. But nowadays, we have this hugely complicated view about the world, which is derived from science and, and in part from common sense. And to some extent, the God hypothesis in the form that I mentioned it is a kind of alternative view about how the whole thing works, how everything is, is sort of hangs together. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a, the, the idea is that we have this view about the world but then there's this completely different story about how, how everything hangs together. How do we normally treat such alternative hypotheses in, 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 uh, in science? Well, if they are sufficiently far away from the way we take the world to be, and if the evidence in support of them are sufficiently uh, thin or not weighty, then we are entitled to ignore them. Suppose, for example, it's, it's nowadays uh, common, commonly accepted that AIDS is caused by the HIV virus, but there, there are alternative hypotheses around. How seriously should we take, for example, that uh, AIDS is, is, uh, is, is really, was, was really, uh, uh, had, had, I don't remember the exact details of these alternative hypotheses, but you know, there, there, there are some around, but they have very slim evidence and although they are proposed by some people, we are somehow entitled not really to take them seriously. And I think this is um, what we actually ought to do with this kind of, of evidence. I, I realize that this is, might be a sort of controversial uh, view, but uh, this is actually the, the way I think of it. Note that this is not proving that God does not exist. I don't think you can prove that God doesn't exist. Just as you can't prove that God does, you can't prove that God does exist. You can't prove that he does not exist. Nor is it making the mistake of simply inferring from there being no evidence for the existence of God to there being sufficient evidence for the non-existence of God. That would be a mistake, but it's not that mistake. So rather, it's, um, the view I'm proposing is treating the God hypothesis as we would treat any other hypothesis about the world, say the Aphrodite hypothesis. We have writings 
2,000 years and more older writings mentioning Aphrodite. That's kind of testimonial evidence for the existence of Aphrodite. Does that give us good reason to take seriously the hypothesis that Aphrodite actually exists? Well, not really. Or the Tor hypothesis. We have not written evidence, but uh, sort of all evidence for the existence of Tor. Is that good reason to think that Tor might actually exist? Should we take this, seri this hypothesis seriously? Well, not really. So, to illustrate what I have in mind here, not to persuade you, but to illustrate, I think most people would agree that the magical mythological star doesn't exist and that we should ignore the hypothesis that it does. So what is the magical mythological star? Well, it's a star that leaves no physical traces and is not subject to laws of physics. So unsurprisingly, no evidence of its existence has ever been found using the usual methods in astrophysics. However, its existence has been reported in certain ancient documents that we found and narratives. And these, because these documents recount uh, dreams and other experiences that some people have about this star. Is this weighty evidence for the, for the existence of this star? Well, I don't think so, particularly if you, if you take, bear in mind that there are thousands of similar narratives and documents, the majority of which are talking about different entities. So it's, it's not that all people testify the same thing, it's rather that the so much testimonial evidence in all directions. Or think about the magical explanatory star. Also, this star leaves no physical traces and it's not subject to laws of physics. So unsurprisingly, evidence of its existence has never been found using the usual methods. However, we can't stop wondering why there are stars or indeed matter or universe or laws of nature in the first place. How did it all come about? Well, because the magical explanatory star is the cause of all things. We just say it is. So that's the evidence for its existence. Well, I'm not sure we should take this uh, explanation uh, too seriously. Or the magical ontologically necessary star, that leaves, also that leaves no physical traces and we can't find it. However, most stars or all stars we know about, they exist contingently. They might not have existed. They happen to be there, but they might not have. Well, we could imagine a star that exists necessarily. So it's a possibility that there could be such a star which exists necessarily. So in some possible world, the necessary star exists. But if the necessary star exists in some possible world, then it exists in all possible worlds, including this world. So the necessary ontologically necessary star exists. Wow, we found a new star. Quick. Okay. I don't think we should take ser too seriously these arguments. There's, of course, a very complicated and serious discussion about exactly what's wrong about them. And um, you mentioned a couple of reasons why, why one would, would think there's nothing wrong about them. They're actually good arguments. I'm not convinced, but I'm, I'm <laughs> well, this kind of situation, you know, you can easily come up with a lot of details and uh, develop these arguments in a quite detailed way such that actually to explain what, what's, what you think is wrong about them would take a long time and, and, and you, you would sort of need the manuscript you had written in advance to do that. But anyway, let me turn to another issue. The view that I presented presupposed in some imprecise sense a largely naturalistic and empiricist framework when assessing the God hypothesis. I presuppose that we should use the standards and methods of science to determine what exists in the world and what doesn't. And I've, as part of that, presuppose that we should give special priority to empirical observations. We shouldn't place too much confidence in traditions, narratives, and in intuitions about how the world must be. One thing which is well known in philosophy nowadays is that our intuitions about how the world must be very, very fragile and quite unreliable. So we should look uh, at uh, empirical observations and we should judge the possibility of various hypotheses on the background of what we take ourselves to know about the world. And given that background, <coughs> certain views turn out to be very, very implausible. So in a sense then, this whole way of arguing might seem question begging. It's question begging against, so it's sort of presupposed a conclusion. It's question begging against someone who firmly believes in God and questions naturalism and empiricism. Yes, it is question begging. But 
as I said in the beginning, I'm not trying to convince someone who rejects this whole picture. I'm just trying to lay out what the picture is. And I'm not trying to propose a Kurgan argument to a person who, who has these views of rejects of naturalism and empiricism. And recall by a Kurgan argument, I mean an argument that rests on premises that the, uh, the opponent is going to accept or rationally ought to accept. I'm not sure I have such an argument. So note now, finally, that uh, there might be a very special dialectical situation now uh, between two opponents in a debate like this. Suppose that Adam sincerely asserts the existence of God and implies or asserts that something is deeply wrong with the whole naturalistic and empiricist approach to understanding the world. In response to Adam's assertions, Bertrand, that's me then, can't simply assert, well, look, we know that God doesn't exist, so forget about all the arguments. We know that. that you can't simply assert that. Bertrand would violate a dialectical norm if he simply sort of reasserts that we know that God does not exist in the face of someone who has just asserted that, well, we know that God do exist. So, and Bertrand can't really, can't simply reassert the case against the existence of God because the naturalistic and empiricist premises for this case has just been called into doubt. So we have, a dis we have a sort of dialectical situation in which the premises for a certain conclusion, namely that we know that God doesn't exist, has been questioned. What you do, well, you can't just state the premises once more, of course. So before reasserting that God doesn't exist, Bertrand should at least establish the case for naturalism and empiricism in a way which is rationally acceptable to Adam. Now, no such way might be available. Adam might be beyond pedagogical reach. That's one way of putting it. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the situation might be that Adam has a worldview, a whole set of views about the world such that the case for naturalism can't be stated in a way such that Adam will accept the premises necessary for accepting the case for naturalism. If that's the case, then Bertrand can't rationally persuade Adam. So Adam in, might in that sense be beyond reach. And of course, Bertrand might be beyond reach for Adam as well for just the same kind of reasons. So yet it might be, actually be true that Bertrand knows that God doesn't exist. Bertrand really knows this. And it might be reasonable for Bertrand to take himself to know this. He just can't assert it in a conversation with Adam without violating the dialectical norms of such uh, discussions because Adam has just called into doubt too many of the premises that Bertrand rests his view upon. Of course, the, the converse might also be the case. It might be that Adam is really right. He can't, there might be shifts in what he can assert now given the stage of the debate. But, um, so, so it's a kind of symmetrical situation. Okay, a final note, I have two more minutes to go. A final note about faith and the role of religious beliefs. Uh, this might be trivial for you, but I want to say it anyway. There's this uh, other notion, I've talked about beliefs in God and knowledge about God. There's this other notion, faith in God. Faith is not an outright belief that God exists, but rather some other sort of mental state like hoping or trusting. And there is the very important phenomenon that faith or belief in God may be an indispensable part of someone's worldview, provide a sense of identity, comfort, consolation, direction, and meaning of lives, and all that. Now, I haven't challenged having faith in God. I haven't challenged organizing one's life around the belief that God exists. I believe that faith in God or belief in God is based on a false assumption. There is no God. But I don't think that this implies that one should give it up. I haven't challenged people having these things. Okay, that's it. I, I want to say one more thing. Uh, I'm fine with the format which you have suggested, you know, 12 minutes, eight minutes and all that. But I'm also fine with not abiding with that format. And I'd actually like to hear what the audience has to say. Of course, also what you have to say. But, uh, these are the words, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, and I apologize for making you a, a member of an uh, as, uh, association that you're not a member of, but uh, now we have cleared that up at least. <laughs>
Now, we'll go back uh, for William Craig. You'll have the floor, please. Before I look again at those two contentions that I said I would defend, we need to say something about the definition that Dr. Koppel has argued, uh, offered for the uh, notion of God. He defined God as a psychological being, and that, that struck me as very odd, because in my vocabulary, that means that God is a mind-dependent entity, a figment of your imagination. And the classical concept of God is that God is mind-independent. God exists whether anyone thinks of him or believes in him. So I, I'm just baffled why Dr. Koppel would think that God is a psychological being. If you define him in that way, then it's easy to prove that God exists. Just think of him and a psychological <laughs> being exists. Now, what we want to know is, is there a mind independent being who is the creator and designer of the universe and so forth? And here, Dr. Koppel, in response to my contention that there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true, more or less agreed with me. He said, I uh, ha cannot prove that God does not exist. He couldn't offer philosophical arguments, inference to the best explanation, or testimonial evidence to support atheism. Indeed, he said, any attempt to do so would be question begging, so that he is not able to offer any non-question begging argument for the existence of God, all he could do, he said, was to enunciate a naturalistic perspective. Well, that's fine, but what we want to know is what is the justification, what's the warrant for that perspective? He says Bertrand, who is a naturalist, might know that God exists even though he has no good arguments for God. Well, that seems to me to be wrong. Uh, Bertrand might believe that God exists, but knowledge entails more than true belief. It entails having some kind of warrant or justification. Otherwise, Bertrand is just making a lucky guess if he believes God doesn't exist and it turns out that he's right. For Bertrand to know that God does not exist, he needs to have some kind of warrant or justification for his atheism, and that Dr. Koppel seems to agree he cannot provide. Now, Dr. Koppel also says, but look at examples like Tor. We don't believe that Tor exists, and in the same way, we don't believe that the god of classical theism exists. But think about that with me. Tor, if he exists, is a biological organism, a physical entity, somewhat like a human being, a physical object. And we know that Tor doesn't exist in the same way that we know that dinosaurs don't exist today. Namely, we can see that they don't exist. But with respect to God, God is a transcendent reality who is beyond space and time, who has created and designed the universe. And so we wouldn't expect to be able to see God with our eyes as we would with Tor. So while we have good evidence that Tor doesn't exist, we're still waiting to see or hear any evidence that God doesn't exist. But Dr. Koppel says, what about the magical star uh, to which he ascribes increasingly attributes of deity? Well, the point here is that this magical star is a logical incoherence. A star is an astronomical body, uh, burning gas, uh, having a certain physical structure and composition. That's what is meant in English by the word star. When you increasingly ascribe to this being the attributes of God, like invisibility, non-physicality, metaphysical necessity, you're simply speaking a different language in which the word star is a, is a word for God. You're in effect talking about God, but just calling it a star. And in that case, we'd want to know, well, do you have any good evidence to think that God does not exist? But if you're talking about a literal star, this is simply a logical incoherence, and therefore we know that it does not exist. So I think that you've got to do more to justify atheism than simply saying that we can look and see that God doesn't exist in the way we can Tor. What about his claim that believing in God is the result of our upbringing? Well, now, if that's meant to be an argument against the existence of God, I'm sure he's familiar with the genetic fallacy which is trying to invalidate a point of view by showing how a person came to believe in it. And that's simply uh, fallacious. You cannot show a view to be false 
by explaining how a person came to hold that belief. Um, he reiterates that there are three types of evidence uh, to which I've also appealed tonight. And he says, but in the case of theism, we don't need to take this seriously because theism is offered as an alternative to the worldview of modern science. And here, I, it's very clear, I think, tonight that he simply failed to connect with the positive case for theism that I presented. Uh, my case in no way is offered as an alternative to modern science. I think all of you heard me appealing to various facts of modern science, which I think uh, are part and parcel of a theistic worldview. Indeed, Dr. Koppel seems to be unaware that there is a flourishing dialogue between science and theology going on in our age. Millions of dollars, thousands of man hours, professional journals uh, are going on in the science and theology uh, dialogue. Both Oxford University and Cambridge University have established chairs in science and theology. So that far from being an alternative to a scientific worldview, uh, a correct view of science is part and parcel of a theistic worldview. And therefore, it is simply a false dichotomy to present um, science as an alternative to theism. So basically then, I don't think we've heard any good arguments tonight by way of evidence for atheism. No philosophical arguments, no inferences to the best explanation, and uh, no testimonial evidence. By contrast, let's review these arguments, if we can, that I've presented. Reasons to think that theism is true. First, philosophical arguments. Remember I argued that every contingent entity has an explanation of its existence. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. The universe is a contingent entity from which it follows that the explanation of the universe is God. This is a non-question begging argument. None of the three premises depends upon belief in the existence of God. These are all justified independently of theism and so constitutes uh, a good philosophical argument for theism. And there are other arguments as well. I alluded to the moral argument, for example. A moral argument like, might go like this. If God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. That is to say, on naturalism, moral values and duties are simply the byproducts of biological and social evolution. They're not objectively binding and true. Premise two, but objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend binding moral values. For example, it's wrong to torture a child for fun, from which it follows logically three, therefore God exists. So we have an additional philosophical argument for God based on a need for a grounding of objective moral values which we apprehend in moral experience. What about the arguments or the inferences to the best explanation? First I talked about the fine tuning of the universe, that the universe is fine tuned for intelligent interactive life. This fine tuning is due to either physical necessity, chance or design. Those are the three live options discussed in the literature today. And then I argued that the best of these explanations is design. This is a non-question begging inference to the best explanation for a designer of the cosmos. The second argument to the best explanation was based on the origin of the universe. I explained on the basis of the bohr guth vilenkin theorem, we have very good evidence that the universe had an absolute beginning. But if the universe had an absolute beginning, the best explanation of this is a transcendent creator. The atheist simply has no explanation for how the universe could come into existence because there is nothing beyond the universe on his worldview. So here are two examples of good inferences to theism as the best explanation. Let me share just an additional one. I have here for my reading on this flight um, a, a book by J.P. Moreland, who is a philosopher of mind and body problems, called Consciousness and the Existence of God. And Moreland argues that mental states of self-awareness are best explained on a theistic view rather than a naturalistic view. He would argue that uh, in the absence of God or on naturalism, uh, mental states of self-awareness would not exist. But obviously, there are mental states of self-awareness, which is best explained then by saying there is an ultimate mind behind the universe, uh, just as we are finite minds, 
and therefore this provides evidence for God. So this would be another example of inference to the best explanation from the phenomenon of consciousness. Finally, testimonial evidence. I argued that uh, historians today who have investigated the historical person Jesus of Nazareth have established the facts such as his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the sudden origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And I want to emphasize, especially for those of you who are not believers here tonight, that I'm not talking about the conclusions of conservative scholars or evangelical scholars. These represent the majority view of the broad mainstream of New Testament historians today. But it seems to me the best explanation of these facts is the explanation the original disciples gave, namely, God raised Jesus from the dead. And that entails that the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. And so I think we have a good argument for Christian theism uh, based upon the historical testimonial evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, none of these needs to be a knockdown argument, but I think they do present a powerful cumulative case in favor of theism. Dr. Koppel said at the beginning of his speech that he wants to show that atheism can be a reasonable position. But I've never denied that. I, I have never said that atheists are irrational or that uh, they're, they're uh, in somehow violating the duties of, uh, or canons of rationality. I think they're wrong, but I'm not saying that they're irrational. So the question is, it seems to me, which way does the evidence point? Do we have good philosophical arguments, inferences to the best explanation and testimonial evidence for atheism? or do we have it for theism? I'm persuaded that the evidence lies strongly on the side of the scale in support of theism, and therefore theism is the more rational of the two worldviews. Actually, the most pressing question <laughs> that comes to my mind is uh, what are you trying to achieve in this debate? I mean, do you try to convince me or do you try to convince people who are inclined to believe that God exists but will be less, will be sort of more confident by listening to your arguments or trying to convince people who squarely don't believe that God exists uh, um, or are you trying to well, here's another, it's, it's just speculation, so here's another thing. Are you trying to create a kind of set of rules for public discussion where asserting that God does exist is more legitimate than it is, for example, in Denmark where, where I suppose one might say that public discussion is Denmark to some, is to some extent governed by a set of norms which it derives from the Protestant Christian, uh, Christianity where religious matters are supposed to be kept in the private sphere, sphere where, and, and, and you ought to appeal to reasons which are accessible to all. Which means that if you have a, a, a community which to some extent secular or, or, or diverse with respect to, to belief in God, then you can't appeal to your conviction that God does exist and you can't appeal to views which are too directly dependent on that assumption because there's this kind of norm that the religious, religious views should be kept for the, in, in, the, in, the, in the private sphere. I mean, John Rawls, that you know, don't know, he, he sort of defends a general view about political liberalism which says that public reason ought to be governed by norms such that you appeal only to things that you know your audience will accept as well. And, and you know, if, if only part of the audience accepts that God exists and you are going to talk to that audience, then you can't appeal to that assumption anymore. But of course, if you can prove all that God exists or if you can say that the balance of evidence is suggests that God exists, then you might change this uh, uh, these norms of public reason such that it becomes a thing you, a thing you can appeal to. But this is just speculation because actually I'm, 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 I'm more concerned or more interested in, in understanding why proving or arguing that God exists is such an important thing 
because as I, as I said, I think for most people who are actually believers, I think the assessment of the evidence that God exists is not really that important in their lives. <laughs> it's for different reasons. Anyway, this is, this is what is, uh, uh, strikes me as, uh, maybe it's just me, but it strikes me as, as the, as the uh, interesting question. But let me get back to some of the comments you, 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 you made. You said that, uh, that you didn't understand why I was talking about about God as a psychological being. What I meant was just that God is a being which somehow has a mind. I didn't say, I didn't write that God is a, is a mind dependent being in the sense that God exists by us thinking of God. Of course you can have that view about God and some people have it and uh, that's not the view I argue against because if God is a mind dependent being in that sense then God exists by us merely thinking about God. So in that sense of course of course, God does exist, but that was not the view I, I, was, I was addressing. Um, and then you said that uh, in response to my comment that, or my view, that Bertrand might be in a position where he actually knows that God doesn't exist. Yet, because of the dialectical situation, it's improper for him to claim that he knows that God exists. And you said this can't be right because the knowledge is not mere true belief. Its knowledge requires justification or warrant. So Bertrand can't claim that. Well, that's a mistake because uh, I think virtually all scholars of epistemology, and by the way, my field is epistemology. It's not philosophy of religion at all. But virtually all scholars of epistemology agree that uh, knowledge requires some degree of justification. But they all also agree that knowing that something is the case doesn't require that you have a, a, a conclusive proof or a, a for this being the case and it doesn't require that your evidence is so strong as to rule out all other options. So I, for example, can know, I'm in a position to know and I do know that there is a, a, a humanly induced global warming can I really rule out all the alternative hypotheses about how the IPCC came to that conclusion? There are many conspiracy theories about that. Can I rule those things out? No, I can't rule it out. Yet, even though there are these alternative hy hypotheses which I can't rule out, I, I, I still am in a position to know that there is actually global warming. So knowledge is not as grand as uh, Descartes and others thought, knowledge requires less and is also less useful. Because although I know that there's global warming, it might not be the case that I know that I know that there's global warming. So you might know things without knowing that you know it. And you might know it without having conclusive evidence for its truth and all that. Which This is all very well rehearsed in epistemology. And uh, the general view that I proposed is simply applying standard views in epistemology to the question of whether we know that God exists. And uh, by the way, the reason I, I, I came to think about that was, uh, was that I was invited to, to a debate a bit like this, where you know, there was the, the theist uh, there over there, and then there was me uh, supposedly having to defend a non-theist view, and I, uh, or an atheist view, and I sort of thought about it. Why is it that we should be always framed as being on equal footing? When what was actually the case in, in that debate, not, not maybe not in this debate, but in that debate, what was actually the case was that's, that's my, uh, that my opponent in this debate, she denied lots of things which is well established in modern science. So why should we be framed as being on an equal footing? So when I thought about that, I said, well, why not simply start by saying what we know? We know that the human being is a biological being that has a biological origin. There are lots of things we know. Many of, many of these things we know about what human beings are like, what the world is like. Many of these things, well, they sort of tie into a world picture according to which God, as conceived in certain ways, doesn't exist. And it's not that we have a proof that God doesn't exist. It's just that it's just not part of this picture. Well, can we then really prove it and so on? No, we can't really prove it. It's, it's a bit like you can't really prove that Aphrodite, Aphrodite doesn't exist. 
I mean, you can easily, of course, there, there might be versions of uh, descriptions of Aphrodite such that you have solid evidence that she didn't exist, but you can invent new versions where it's not so obvious that you have evidence that she didn't exist. You can invent lots of versions of deities where, which are tailored such that we don't have evidence, strong evidence that they don't exist, yet they are so, so awkward, or so sort of strange hypothesis compared to what we do take ourselves to know that we are entitled to ignore it. That's the kind of view. Let me, let me comment some of the, well actually, um, comment a few other things. I can't comment on, on all of what you said. Well, there's a burden of proof issue here. Uh, you seem to imply that uh, it's the atheist who has the burden of proof because there's a case in favor of, the of theism and if the atheist can't sort of rebut all parts of that case, then theism wins by because you haven't lifted your burden of proof. I actually think the burden of proof arguments in philosophy are spurious, spurious. You should be quite careful about them because there's usually no uncontroversial ways in which you can sort of allocate burden of proof. So I don't want to rest my case on, on a burden of proof thing. And that's also why I didn't want to say that I've presented an argument against theist. I've just laid out what a reasonable atheism is. I've never said in writing or elsewhere that you should, or anyone should think that the atheists are not reasonable persons. I don't think you think that. Let me then uh, do something which I uh, actually, I'm not very happy about to do, to do but, uh, but I want to do nonetheless, engage with some of your arguments. Well, I think all of the arguments you have given, which are partial evidence for existence of God, they, they're fine arguments, but they all rest on premises, one or more of which are extremely controversial in philosophy, and you know this. For example, one argument is that there are objective values. Well, the majority, or a very, very large proportion of people doing meta-ethics, doing the philosophical study of the nature of ethics, they actually deny that. They don't think they're objective values. And many, many of those people who do think they're objective values, they don't think that God is the best explanation of that. There are very there are many other explanations. And um, the, the, the idea that every contingent entity has an explanation, it's a kind of intuitive ontological principle about the basic nature of, 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 of the world. Well, these intuitive ontological principles, all of them are very much in dispute. There's no, nothing like a general consensus in philosophy of people doing ontology, I think, <laughs> about the status of these intuitive ontological principles. In particular, if we apply these intuitive ontological principles in such remote scenarios as sort of a few millise milliseconds before the Big Bang. I mean, we might have strong intuitions which are quite reliable about every ordinary event having a cause. But the creation of the universe was by no means an ordinary event. I mean, I actually think we should suspend our intuitions about what must uh, be true in those cases, in, in, in those kinds of scenarios, and then leave it to the physicist to speculate about. Let me finally add one more thing. Suppose that there is some kind of entity of a completely different order, a completely different kind of entity, which is the explanation of this entity, the universe. So we have this entity, the universe. Why did it exist? Well, there's this other entity of a completely different nature. Is that God? Well, is that the kind of psychological, is, is that a mind that we can pray to, that we can think about, a mind that can hear us, a mind that can decide to act and intervene in our life? Is that a mind that can decide to, to create moral norms? I mean, I mean, all we know about this entity is that it's of a, of a completely different order and it's the course of the universe. Where does all, the, all these other things come in? Maybe, I'm, I'm sure you actually have thought about it and, and have, have explanations, but, um, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, you know, you know, you know, try to go into a physics department and tell them, hey, look, the universe, is, the universe started in this way, and by the way, this completely different entity also explains all these other things. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't believe it, I have to say. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's it.
Before I look at those two contentions again, let me address the question, what are we trying to achieve here this evening? Well, I think candidly, the question of the existence of God is the most important question that a human being can ask. If Christian theism is true, then there is a personal creator and designer of the universe who loves you and who wants you to come into a personal relationship with him forever. If that is true, this is the greatest news ever announced. So surely it's incumbent upon us to look at the evidence and arguments. And I find that many university students are never exposed to these issues. And so that's one reason that I'm motivated as a Christian theist to, sh to share these arguments and evidences in an open forum where there's a level playing field where both sides can be heard and students can make up their own mind as to where the evidence points. Now, have we heard any good reasons tonight to think that atheism is true? Well, here, Dr. Koppel in his last speech said that I have said the burden of proof is on the atheists uh, exclusively. Well, not at all. I spent the bulk of my speech attempting to bear the burden of proof as to establishing theism to be true. In a debate situation, both sides bear the burden of proof. It's an argument between atheism and theism. One asserts God does not exist, the other asserts God does exist, and both bear the burden of proof to give their arguments and evidence as to why they think their view is true. So both of us have an equal responsibility. Dr. Um, Koppel said, but uh, in regard to atheism, I'm uh, not claiming that I have conclusive proof in order to know that God does not exist. Fine, I haven't claimed conclusive proof either. Remember I said my arguments were not down arguments. But I simply want to know what justification does he have for being an, an atheist? Uh, he knows that knowledge is more than just true belief. There needs to be some justification, and I agree with him. I'm not suggesting that you need to know that you know in order for you to know something. I agree with that principle that that's not necessary. But I do want to know what is the justification for atheism. The example of global warming is an interesting one. The inference that global warming is man-made would be an example of inference to the best explanation, right? So what's an example of inference to the best explanation with regard to atheism? Um, he says that in many cases we're not able to justify our beliefs, and I would agree with that. There are certain properly basic beliefs that we all hold that are not justified by inference, but I don't see how atheism could be one of these. What would make or justify atheism as a properly basic belief not requiring some kind of warrant? Um, I haven't, uh, well, I, I just ask, I'll just leave the question there. What is the justification for atheism? What arguments or evidence, uh, non-question begging, can he offer? So I don't think we've heard any good reasons to think that atheism is true. Have we heard some good reasons to think that theism is true? Well, first I've offered philosophical arguments. And in the last speech, we heard a response to my Leibnizian cosmological argument. He said the premises of these arguments are extremely contested, uh, that the premises are in dispute. Of course, that's what philosophy is. I once remarked to my friend Quentin Smith, a philosopher at University of Western Michigan, that a, a certain position was controversial. And Quentin said to me, Bill, everything in philosophy is controversial. Uh, and that's very true. There's no position that hasn't been defended by some philosopher. So you can't just dismiss arguments by saying they're controversial. You need to examine the premises. For example, the premise that every contingent being that exists has an explanation for its existence. That seems to me to be uh, almost obviously true. If something is possible, but it's not necessary, and it does exist, then why does it exist? If you were walking through the woods and came across a translucent ball lying on the ground, you would naturally wonder what was the explanation for why it exists? How did it come to be there? If somebody told you it just exists inexplicably, forget about it, you'd think he was just joking. Now notice that increasing the ball so that it's, or increasing the size of the ball so it's the size of a car or the size of a house or the size of a planet, 
doesn't do anything to provide a, an explanation or remove the need for an explanation, making it the size of a galaxy, the size of the universe. Doesn't remove the need for or supply an explanation of why this contingent entity exists. By contrast, theism can provide such an explanation where atheism is bereft of an explanation. So this seems to me a good inference to the best explanation for theism. Um, with regard to his claim that all this gives you is an entity of a completely different order, well, that's not true. There, the, I presented a cumulative case for Christian theism that, if you put the arguments together, give you a beginningless, uncaused, changeless, immaterial, uh, timeless, enormously powerful, uh, good, uh, metaphysically necessary, creator and designer of the universe who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Now that's a pretty good cumulative case for theism. This is not some obscure flying spaghetti monster that we're talking about. This is a being that has specific properties. With respect to the moral argument, he says, well, some people deny the existence of objective moral values. Certainly they do, but I think moral anti-realists are wrong. I think in moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective moral values. For example, that torturing a child for fun is wrong. And people who say, uh, fail to see that are just morally handicapped. They're the moral equivalent of a blind person who says, I, I can't see it and therefore it doesn't exist. Uh, I think if, if you agree with me that in moral experience there are at least some objective moral values and duties, then you should agree with me that theism is true as the best explanation, or as a philosophical argument for the ground of moral values. Uh, the fine-tuning argument wasn't responded to. What about the argument from the origin of the universe? Um, here, uh, his suggestion was that perhaps the universe came into being without a cause. Now, if that's the alternative to theism, then I think atheists have to be forever silent with respect to the rash irrationality, supposedly, of theists, because nothing could be more irrational to think that the universe could come into being uncaused out of nothing. That is literally worse than magic. In, in magic, when a rabbit is pulled out of the hat by the magician, at least you've got the magician, uh, not to mention the hat. But in this case, the universe is supposed to have just popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing, which I think is surely metaphysically absurd. Nothing has no properties, no potentialities. It's not anything. So this is, in effect, to say there is no explanation of the origin of the universe. And then I shared the testimonial evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, which give us good grounds for thinking that this creator and designer and absolute source of moral goodness has revealed himself decisively in Jesus of Nazareth. So I think on balance, we've got a good case for Christian theism going tonight, and therefore I hope that each of you will uh, honestly explore this option for yourself. Let me mention one thing, a few things. Um, I don't think you have good cases. Um, you say, and this seems to be a sort of standard move, you say that, well, you know, these premises are used in my arguments. They're, of course, controversial premises, but of course, every, everything is controversial. Well, yes, but this means that all these premises uh, are such that it's very uncertain whether they're true. This is what it means. So we have these arguments based on premises of which you have agreed that it's very, very uncertain whether they're true. This is what it means, or this is what we ought to infer from their controversiality or their per perpetual co con controversiality. You say, you say that, well, you know, it's extremely controversial whether they're objective moral values. Uh, among people who would like there to be objective moral value and who have thought hard, hard about it, it's extremely controversial. And you say, well, they're just wrong. Well, maybe a more reasonable ex uh, stance to take to that question is, well, it's very controversial and very uncertain whether there are, more value, whether there are objective moral values. There might be, there might not be. It's very uncertain whether there are. And I think this is actually true for 
for all your arguments that one or more of the premises are such that a reasonable assessment of that premise would have it would, would lead to the conclusion that it's very uncertain whether that premise is true. Which means that, okay, there's some evidence for the existence of God. But it's evidence based on, on fragile premises. And I don't think this is very strange, but, but, uh, and I think uh, one reason, for example, why, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm sure you all, you all know that philosophers and theologians have discussed the case for the existence of God for more than a thousand years without sort of reaching any major conclusions, without convincing sympathetic skeptics. Why is that? Well, I think a good guess is that it's because these arguments very often or always depends on very controversial premises. Much of philosophy is like that, of course. But this doesn't mean that the argument for God's existence are very good then. It just means that they're just as bad as many other philosophical arguments. And philosophical arguments are generally quite bad. And especially philosophical arguments with very, very strong conclusions about what the world is like. They typically depend on very weak, odd, strange premises. So, I mean, as a general piece of advice to anyone listening to a philosopher, if they come up with a very strong conclusion about what the world is like, Look at the premises. They are probably wrong or uh, only weakly supported. But anyway, I'm, I'm just sort of kind of restating, restating my case and uh, 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 sort of reiterating a <laughs> partial strategy of not actually responding to in details to the argument. I, I'd actually like to address the other question, um, the most important question. The, the question of the existence of God is the most important question. Uh, in a sense, yes, but I suppose it does depend on what we, as what we assume about uh, the nature of God. For example, if God is punishing everyone who doesn't believe he exists, then I'd agree this is a very important question because I'm in for, uh, you know. <laughs> then that's, that's a really important question. But if we just say that, well, God is just the name of some entity of a completely different order, that's the cause of the universe, then it's not a very important question. You know, if, if that's all there is to it, well, maybe it's that entity, maybe it's some other explanation. It doesn't really matter for my life or my afterlife. It doesn't show that I even have an afterlife. It doesn't really matter for anything. So it really depends on which properties we attribute to God, whether this is such an important question. Um, and of course, it's because in the Christian tradition and many other traditions, so many uh, attributes has been made to God that it has come out as an important question. Um, yeah. But actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I have that much more to know. Four, four more minutes to go, so, but could I, could I invite comments from the, from the audience, or is that sort of out of bounds? Or? <laughs> I think we'll take that after the uh, call break. Okay, yeah, so, so let me add, add one more thing. Suppose that uh, we are forced to say that the universe, the existence of the universe has no explanation. There could be a reason why we could be forced to say that. Suppose we say that giving an explanation of some event is explaining how this event came about by appealing to the natural laws. So when we explain something, we basically say here are the natural laws governing that event and here are the initial conditions and that's why it happened. Suppose now we say, or we agree with what some cosmologists say, I'm not one of them, but, but, but I know, only know this by sort of hearsay, but suppose we agree that when the universe came into existence, it was not only matter that was gen generated, it was also the laws. Well, if the laws came into existence at that event, and if by explaining an event we mean explaining how that event came about given that the laws exist, then it follows that there is no explanation of that event. So the, the universe could have no explanation. Actually, don't have any firm intuitions about whether there's a bad outcome or not. I mean, if, if my car is on the parking lot and suddenly disappears, I have very strong intuition that there must be some explanation why this happened. But the Big Bang is a very different thing, in particular if we also assume that the Big Bang involved 
the creation of the, of the natural laws. So I ought to suspend my intuitions about whether, you know, whether things can happen without an explanation. If we, by explanation, understand things happening in accordance with of explaining how things happen given the natural laws, and if we think that the Big Bang implies that the laws came into existence at that moment, then it follows that there is no explanation. That's not, that's not a, a bad thing. It's just a fact of the natural world that, or it might be. I, I don't know whether this is the case, but it might just be a fact of the natural world that, that it is like that. Does it mean that the whole world is bereft of rationality, that everything is irrational. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that that event didn't have an explanation. All other events do have explanations. And there are many, many forms of rationality in the world and in our lives uh, and in the way we organize society and so, which, which are all fine. They are simply completely unaffected by that original strange event. In my closing remarks, let me try to draw together some of the threads of the debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, I think it's very evident that we haven't heard any good reasons tonight to think that atheism is true. No philosophical arguments, no inferences to the best explanation, no testimonial evidence. By contrast, I think we've heard some no, good... Okay, <laughs> he'll testify. I think we have, by contrast, heard good reasons to think that uh, theism is true. First, philosophical arguments, the argument from contingency, and then I suggested the moral argument. Here, Dr. Koppel said in his last speech, but when I say they're controversial, that means that their premises are very uncertain as to whether they're true. Well, that's not what I meant when I said they're controversial. When I say they're controversial, I mean it's a subject of a vivid debate. It's the subject of great debate. That's what I mean by controversy. But I don't think that these are necessarily highly uncertain pr uh, propositions. For example, take the premise that moral values and duties exist objectively. I feel very certain that there's a moral difference between taking a little child in your arms and loving him or her and slashing that little child's face with a knife uh, and, and abusing that child sexually. I think there's a moral difference between those two that's evident. So certainly there are moral nihilists who, who say these are morally indifferent. But as uh, Louise Anthony uh, once remarked, who is herself a non-theist philosopher, she said any argument for moral skepticism is going to be based upon premises which are less obvious than the existence of objective moral values themselves so that moral skepticism could never be justified in principle. So when I say that these arguments are controversial, I mean they're the subject of heated debate, but not that they're based upon highly uncertain premises. In fact, Dr. Koppel seems to be unaware that there is a renaissance of natural theology going on in our day, especially in the Anglophone world of uh, analytic philosophy in which uh, increasing numbers of philosophers at our finest universities are joining the lists in um, defending and explicating these arguments for God's existence. He suggests that if the universe began to exist with all its laws, then there cannot be an explanation of the origin of the universe. This is a good reason for thinking that the cause of the universe is personal. As Richard Swinburne of Oxford University has argued, there are two types of explanation, one in terms of initial conditions and scientific laws, the other in terms of a personal agent and his volitions. And these are both equally valid ways of explaining something. In the case of an absolute origin of the universe, there cannot be a scientific explanation, as I said. Therefore, that there is a cause of the universe requires that this cause be a personal agent, and the origin of the universe is, in, uh, is uh, to be explained in terms of the volitions of this personal agent. So that's a second reason to think that we're dealing here with a personal cause. I gave an, another argument in my first speech in contrasting an abstract object with an unembodied mind or consciousness and arguing that the unembodied mind or consciousness is the better explanation. As for inference to the best explanation, we've not heard any response to the fine-tuning argument. 
um, or to the origin of the universe out of nothing, except to say that the universe could just pop into being out of nothing, but as I explained, uh, that just means that you can't have a scientific explanation of an absolute origin, but that being should come from non-being is surely metaphysically absurd. The testimonial evidence for the resurrection of Jesus has gone undiscussed. Finally, there is one other type of testimonial evidence, and Dr. Koppel just alluded to it at the beginning of this speech, and that is personal testimonial evidence. And I want to close by saying that I myself, while not raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family, first heard the message of the Christian gospel as a teenager. And I began to explore it. I began to read the New Testament. I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And after a month, uh, about six months of the most intense soul searching I've ever went through, I experienced a kind of spiritual rebirth in which God became a living reality in my life, a reality that I've walked with now for over 40 years, a reality that I believe can change your life as well if you will seek it with an open heart and with an open mind. So I hope that as a result of the debate tonight, some of you will embark on such a search, and I hope that it will also issue finally in the knowledge of God if you have not yet found him. Okay, let me just uh, correct two, uh, two minor things, or address two minor things in what you said. Um, I didn't say that you said that controversial <laughs> means lack of certainty. What I said was that if there is contr controversy in philosophy about a certain issue, then the rational response to that should be that you reduce your confidence. This has been much discussed in a, in a huge debate on disagreement. What's the rational reaction to disagreement? I mean, you, you, you have a view, you find out that someone who apparently is just as smart as you and has thought just as hard about the same issue as you, you find out this person has a different view. You think that so-and-so is the case, he thinks that it's not the case, you have, assessed, you have thought about the same evidence equally carefully, what should your response be? Well, many people in this debate, not everyone, but many people in this debate think that the rational response ought to be to reduce your confidence. You should be less confident that you're right upon learning that some equally intelligent opponent thinks that you're not right. Of course, that's a response, that's a theory about rational response to disagreement, which is itself somewhat controversial which means that there's a higher order problem for this uh, theory, which has been addressed eloquently by David Christensen and, and Andy Egan and others. But still, I think there's something to it. I mean, and this was what I meant. When we, as we do in philosophy, have all these controversial assumptions that we work upon, then what we ought to do when we discover that other philosophers have thought about it, I actually don't really agree, then we ought to be less confident. Okay, so, even if you're quite confident that uh, people who don't think their objective moral values are wrong, then perhaps you should be less confident that you're right in this. Also, the case you mentioned, who could question that, uh, that abusing a child is wrong? Who could question that? Well, you know this, but you might, out there might not know this. That's not the dispute. Everyone agrees that abusing a child is wrong. The dispute is whether you need to postulate objective moral values in order to account for the wrongness of this. And this is what many people have said, like Blackburn, Ayer, Hare, many, many others, even Kant. He said that there's no sort of objective wrongness out there. And Kant even said that it's not that, it's, it's wrong to abuse a child, of course but it's not wrong because God has said so. That's not why it's wrong. It's wrong because if you understand what reason requires from you, you would understand that you shouldn't do this. So, so but these things are very much in, in dispute. And, and, and therefore, I, I, I think you are to some extent 
you're overstating your case. You keep saying that you have these, uh, this evidence and these arguments that hasn't been responded to. And I keep saying that it's, it's true that these arguments, but it's also true that they're based on premises which are extremely controversial. And you then say, well, when I said they were controversial, I didn't mean that I, that I was not confident about them. I just m meant that other people don't buy them. Well, what I say is that you might be as confident about these premises as you like, <laughs> as you want to be, or as you can manage to be. But many, many other philosophers who look at these premises, they're not very confident that they're correct. And uh, that's, I think that's, well, that could might be my, my, my closing message. I think it was something else. No, actually, actually not. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, now it's time for our question uh, session. And we would like you to come forward with questions. And if you want, if you primarily want an answer from Clemens Kabel, then you go to this microphone over here. And if you primarily want to put a question forward to Professor Craig, then you go to the microphone on the other side. And please introduce yourself by name and then come, with a, come forward with a question. Try to make it short and precise. And then we'll make sure that the answers will be very short and precise also. There will be two minutes for answering for uh, the person that, the, the speaker that the question is put forward to uh, primarily, and then uh, for the other speaker, there will be just one minute to respond to it. So, do we have anyone who wants to put forward a question? It's over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> My question is regarding the testimonial evidence, uh, and uh, my question is regarding the last testament, which I believe is the Quran, where there is written some scientific uh, verses regarding the expansion of the universe, regarding the uh, development on the, of the embryo, things that we only right now, without development of science, can know. So do you think that the Prophet Muhammad was extremely intelligent, or do we think like Professor Keith L. Moore of embryology in Canada, that he was divinely inspired, or do, did Muhammad have a, had a Hubble telescope or <laughs> a big microscope, or do we see this as some kind of evidence from God? Thank you very much. Can I ask a question in return? Uh, yes. What, what do you think is the best explanation for all the other religious writings of the world? There must be like 10,000 at least claiming different things. What's the explanation that they exist? That's a question to you. <laughs> actually, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very good question. Actually I, actually, I believe that Jesus, Moses, and all these people, they came with the same, basically, uh, divine message that there is one God and a moral code, but there were some variations in that times. For example, the prophet Moses came with much more laws. The prophet Jesus came with some kind of variation of these laws. He came, uh, he said to people, focus more on the inner things. But I agree with you that men has a very uh, big interest in changing religion. So I think that people originally had the divine messages, but they changed it to get some kind of, uh, of uh, benefits. So, yeah. But uh, so now you explain, now you give us what you think is the best explanation why the three uh, Abrahamitic religions have, have the kind of structure content that they have. But that was not the question I asked. I think I'm probably not wrong if I say that there's like 10,000 10, different religions in the world. And if you include those that don't exist anymore but have sort of died out for various reasons, then there's probably more than that. And many of them have either written or oral uh, uh, kind of testimony. And what's the explanation that there is this testimony, that the testimony exists? What's the explanation? I mean, you, you've taken three of them and said that, well, in those three cases, the explanation is divine. But then in the 10,000 minus three other cases, the explanation is not divine. So why is, it this, why is there a divine explanation in these three cases and not the, all, the, all the other cases? 
the fact that you believe that, does that have something to do with, your, with <laughs> the place you came from? <laughs> People tend to think that their own religion gives the right answers, but all the others are wrong. <laughs> and which is kind of strange. I mean, you, you, you get, you get, you get uh, 10,000 testimonial evidences. One of them is your own. And then you conclude, this must be right, the other are wrong. Why not say, well, if there are 10,000 different testimonial evidences, well, then the likelihood that any of them is right is probably very small, and the reason why, that they, why they sort of came up uh, is, is of a different kind. That, yeah. that, that, that's the kind of line I would say. I, I believe we have a lot of questions tonight, so Professor Craig, would yeah. you make a comment to this? Very quickly, I studied Islam as part of my theological studies in Munich, and I'm convinced that this attempt to try to find scientific knowledge in the Quran that couldn't have been known at that time is just spurious. Uh, it's not that Muhammad was extremely intelligent, it's that modern Muslims are reading things into the text, reading between the lines that aren't there. For example, this claim about the prediction of modern embryology is simply nonsense. The Quran says something about the embryo being a clot of blood, which is just medically false, but in any case is knowledge that was known or could have been derived from the ancient physician Galen. So I, I think this is really uh, an attempt on the part of Muslim apologists to justify the Quran that doesn't hold scrutiny. Thank you very much. Do we have a question for Professor Craig? Hi, uh, my name is Rasmus. Uh, I have a question for uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, in your philosoph philosophical argument, you said that the universe is contingent and it has an absolute beginning. And you used the Big Bang Theory, uh, not the show, um, the actual scientific theory, to, in order to prove that this is um, irrational for believing that it had a creator and that creator was God. But this is a, mi a misinterpretation of the Big Bang Theory because the Big Bang Theory said that there was a primeval state of the universe. And before that, the laws of physics as, as we know them are not there anymore. So any explanation of what went on before is something we cannot talk about. Uh -huh. And so when you say that the thing that went before the Big Bang must have had an absolute beginning, that's just speculation. And the only two possible options there are is that either it has always existed or it came into existence. Why do you favor it came into existence because of God? Because there is no reason to believe the one assumption over the other. All right, you asked a number of questions. First of all, um, is the universe eternal or did it have a beginning? The scientific evidence is overwhelming and one-sided that the universe did begin to exist and that there was a first physical state which did not have anything prior to it. I think you're simply incorrect in your assertion that it doesn't represent an absolute beginning. Look at the bord guth vilenkin theorem uh, as well as uh, other models in contemporary cosmology uh, none of them have been able to be extrapolated to past infinity. They involve a past space-time boundary before which nothing exists. So either there is a transcendent being beyond the universe which brought the universe into being, or else the universe just popped into existence uncaused from absolutely nothing, which as I say I think is worse than magic. Now why think that this is a personal being? Well I, I gave an argument for that. I said that the only things that I'm aware of in my study of metaphysics that could be characterized as transcending time and space, matter and energy being immaterial are either abstract objects like numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects or else an unembodied mind. Uh, but abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And we're talking about something that caused the universe to come into existence. So I think we're led to the existence of a beginningless, uncaused, uh, transcendent mind which brought the universe into being. And I would not say this existed before the Big Bang. There is no moment before the Big Bang. This thing is causally prior to the Big Bang, but it is not temporally prior to the Big Bang. The Big Bang represents the beginning of time and space as well as matter and energy. So this is a transcendent being that exists beyond time and space. It's beyond the Big Bang, but it's not temporally prior to the Big Bang. Thank you very much. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, I think I, I share your sentiments. <laughs> I mean, you, you're now talking about a causal relation between 
sort of bringing the universe into existence and the causing agent is just a mind. It's just a mind. And this, but, and there are, no, there, there are no physical laws. So this mind causes the universe to exist in the absence of laws, physical laws, and in the absence of time and space. I mean, all causal relations we know of, they occur in time and space. <coughs> So, so it's, it's a, of course, it's a kind of sort of explanation you might propose, but it's, it's, I think everyone who thinks about this, they agree that it's a kind of explanation that raises many more questions than it actually solves. Thank you very much. Next questions over here, please. Hello, I'm uh, Christian by name and by faith. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been taught by the both of you, you at the University of Copenhagen, and you through your uh, excellent web page and your several books. Um, and it's a great uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, my question is this. Um, I believe, I think you believe, uh, Klimsk, that there are such a thing as electrons. Right. But why? Why do you believe that there are, that there are such a thing as electrons? I mean, that's controversial. There are a lot of anti-realists in philosophy of science who think that uh, electrons do not exist or quarks do not exist and so forth. So what are your reasons for believing that they actually exist? Well, the reasons, basically it's a kind of testimonial reason. The reason I believe they exist is that this is what the relevant communities in science uh, assert. And the reason they assert it is that it uh, is the best explanation of a vast amount of evidence. It fits into the best explanation. So that's why I think they exist. But then there's another question. What do we mean by existing? Should we have a realist interpretation of the existence of electrons or should we have an anti-realist? Where a realist interpretation roughly says that they are out there, they are particular, they are entities out there independent of our minds and our ways of uh, inquiring in the world. Well, and the anti-realist uh, interpretation of the existence of electrons is different. It says that uh, somehow they don't exist by themselves. They're somehow constructs of our minds or our, our theories. So they're kind of, you know, mind-dependent entities. I myself is an, a realist about physical entities. I think they exist really out there. I, I, I don't I've, I've, I've looked into the sort of the kind of arguments for anti-realism uh, proposed by Michael Dahmer and uh, Bas van Frasen, and uh, I'm, I'm not convinced by them. I actually don't think they have a very strong case for anti-realism. The same goes for Crispin Wright. So that's, that's, that's the kind of reasons. And of course you could have the same question regarding God. You could say that God exists, but we should be an anti-realist about God. I don't think that would be your view. No. no. So being an anti-realist about God is saying, hey, God exists, I believe that God exists, but psh, by the way, God is just some kind of construction made out of our minds or our language or our ways of inquiry. It's not really out there. It's, it's kind of some kind of social construction as it would be today. I don't think many Christians like that idea, but though, 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 though some do. But the, the view I'm arguing against is not a constructivist notion of God. It's a realist notion of God. The question is helpful because these electrons and other fundamental particles are a nice analog to inference to the best explanation to God. You can't see electrons, you can't touch them, you can't feel them. So why do you believe they really exist, that there are mind independent entities? Well, it's an inference to the best explanation. By positing the existence of electrons, it enables you to explain a lot of phenomena that we can observe. And it's like that with theism. You can't touch God, you can't see him, you can't feel him, he's a transcendent being. But by postulating this being's existence, it enables you to explain a lot of stuff that otherwise is just inexplicable, like the origin of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, uh, states of mental awareness and so forth. So I think the question uh, presents a helpful analogy for those of you who are trying to think about inferring to God as uh, the best explanation. Thank you very much. We'll have another question from here. Hello, my name is Andreas. I have a question for you, of course. 
Um, Dr. Kappel has touched upon the fact that we do not necessarily have to use God as our undetectable creator of everything. We could use the flying spaghetti monster or Russell's teapot or anything. Um, there's this fact, and then there's the fact that the, the resurrection, you used the resurrection of Jesus. Um, that myth is, it's not really unique. Uh, there's been a lot of other creation myths and uh, resurrection myths like that in other religions, and there are thousands of other religions. Now, I, I know I'm probably not gonna convert you in front of 600 people, uh, <laughs> but do, doesn't that make you wonder at least? Um, perhaps it would if it were accurate, but it's not. <laughs> um, with respect to the flying spaghetti monster, I think I dealt with that in the debate. The arguments, if they're successful, give you an immaterial, transcendent reality that exists beyond time and space and that brought all matter and energy into existence. The flying spaghetti monster is made out of a couple of meatballs and a bunch of spaghetti. It's a material entity that cannot exist beyond time and space and therefore cannot be the cause of the universe. So unless we're talking incoherent nonsense, uh, you can see that the type of theism that we get to is going to have very specific properties of this being that will exclude things like uh, the flying spaghetti monster. It, it, it won't get you to Christian theism, these first arguments, but it will get you a sort of monotheism, a, a personal creator and designer of the world who is the ground of absolute goodness. And then my arguments about the historicity of Jesus would get you to Christian theism. Now, it's in fact a myth perpetrated on YouTube and the internet that there are ancient myths of dying and rising gods in, in the ancient world. This was uh, a contention of scholars in comparative religion back in the late 1700s, 1800s, that is now almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarships of ancient religion. Look at a book by a Trigg Mettinger, who is, I believe, a Swedish scholar who has written a, a major book on dying and rising gods. And he says, people who think that there were pagan myths of dying and rising deities are, are like dinosaurs today. Hardly anybody believes that there were such things. When you look at these supposed parallels, they turn out to be spurious and concocted. And in fact, there's nothing in pagan mythology comparable to uh, Jesus' resurrection. So this is just misinformation that's disseminated in popular media that isn't characteristic of uh, scholarship on, on ancient mythology and, and religion. And uh, Professor Kabel, how do you look at it? <laughs> if well, you look at I it. don't really have a strong view about it, but I think there's an interesting disanalogy in the way that you refer to historical expertise, which you take for granted. But when I re refer to philosophical expertise on a number of the questions that you have addressed, then you certainly don't take that for granted. <laughs> so, there are, I mean, you, you can say that among scholars of, of this and that, uh, there's, there's so much agreement that, uh, that uh, these were the historical facts, and you s expect us all to take, take your word for it, which is fine, of course, but, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a sort of member of the international philosophical community. I go to conferences. I have some view about what, what, what are the dominant views, what are the extremely controversial views, and uh, what, what, what's, what's quite certain, what's very uncertain, or regarded as very uncertain. And you don't, I mean, you, you, you don't take these reports quite as seriously as your own reports about historians. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, do we have another question? To Hi, uh, my name is Raj. Uh, so my question is regarding your definition of God. Um, so it seems today that a lot of people throw around this red herring of other gods, sort of a smokescreen tactic. Um, whereas if one even looks at, into antiquity, one sees that, in fact, the people in arts had proposed, for instance, many gods of polytheism and so on, and people in philosophy had refuted these even back into uh, antiquity. Um, so back to your pure definition of God, as opposed to Tor and so on, and Aphrodite and so on, um, of course one can easily refute them as Craig said. With respect to this definition, this very definition, can you, can you provide some solid uh, reasons 
to disbelieve it. Not some doubts, but rather positive reasons why such an entity with, you know, who is uh, transcendent, a mind, and so on, could not exist. Um, I mean, and, and also in light of the ontological argument, we need to show that it doesn't even possibly exist, such a being. Why do we need to do that? Well, I mean, I think the ontological argument powerfully provides reasons to believe that if it even is possible, uh, that such a, you know, from this pure definition, forget the other thousands of gods, and even the Christian God, just take God as we've defined it, that you need to actually show that this isn't even a possibility. Can you show that? Or can you at least provide some positive reasons why such a, vase, uh, such a being cannot, or entity cannot exist? Um, all I've heard is just doubts, so I want to hear some positive reasons. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure you're going to be, going to be satisfied. Uh, one thing, you, I think you asked for two things. Could you give us reasons to think that such a being could not even possibly exist? I don't think I can give such a reason. I think it's a possibility. I mean, the, so reasons that such a being doesn't exist. Well, there are reasons of the same kind as our reasons to think that the Phlogiston doesn't exist. Phlogiston. You don't know what it is. Well, before modern chemistry was invented, people thought that, um, that, that, well, that you should explain fire and, and certain chemical reactions by postulating a certain entity. But then, at a later stage, it turned out that you can explain these events in, in other ways. Of course, that might all have been wrong. I mean, the Phlogiston people might all have been right, and all the other evidence why this doesn't exist, this is also doubt. No, it's, what I said is that the way that science normally operate and then the way that we in general operate is that um, we operate by inference to best explanations. So what is that exactly? So what's the inference to, a, to an explanation that this doesn't exist as opposed to an inference to a doubt? And that's not even inference, that's just well, saying, oh, it's, I doubt. Well, the inference this. to the best explanation goes as follows. Suppose you have competing explanations. One is that God exists, one is doesn't entail that God exists. And you think the one that does not entail that God exists is the best, okay. then that's your reason for thinking that God doesn't exist. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, that, that's, a, that's a completely standard. Well, I think it's a mistake for Dr. Koppel to keep comparing God to existent physical or non-existent physical entities like phlogiston or Tor. In these cases where you're talking about physical entities, if they existed, you would see them or you would, you would have empirical evidence of them. And so the fact that uh, you've, you've demonstrated that phlogiston doesn't exist or that Tor doesn't exist doesn't have any bearing upon a question like whether or not God as classically conceived as a transcendent creator and designer of the universe exists. Um, God would be more like the case of the electrons or perhaps like the case of uh, other universes where if these things existed, um, the, the absence of evidence for them wouldn't necessarily mean they don't exist. Uh, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. It's only in the case that if the thing did exist that you would expect to have more evidence that you do that the absence of that evidence would count against the existence of that thing. Thank you very much. I think we have more questions and uh, we should get some of them over here, perhaps. Hi, my name is Justin um, and I would like to build off uh, the first question that was on this side. Um, and it was about the, uh, starting with the, the Big Bang, I yes. think, I think the, the uh, this is the build up, <laughs> that the, uh, idea that he was presenting that is uh, we are uncertain about before then, and I bring this up um, to address the first point of the philosophical argument of that the um, the universe that we know that we experience. I believe uh, I believe the word you used was contingent. Yes, um, that was that, a separate argument from the origin right, of the universe right, right. argument. And that so we have a, a universe that we know that is contingent, and then we have this idea, this being uh, that we are calling God that is, is not contingent, that is an inherent. And um, for, in, in what way can we uh, uh, suggest that the, it's more reasonable that this, uh, this uh, being that we don't know, the God, is more inherent 
than the universe that we know? Why can we? Why are we assuming ah. that the universe is contingent and okay. this being is not contingent? All right, now this is a good question. What he's saying is, all right, okay, let's grant that every contingent entity has an explanation of its existence. Why think that the universe is a contingent entity? Maybe the universe exists metaphysically necessarily. And that would concern the third premise of my argument. And as I said in my opening speech, I'm not aware of any philosopher, contemporary philosopher or physicist, who thinks that the universe exists metaphysically necessarily, that it's not contingent. Now, why is that? Well, because it's very easy to conceive of a possible world in which a different collection of fundamental particles or fundamental fields exist. And if that were the case, then a different universe would exist. Uh, consider by way of analogy your shoes. Say they're made of, of leather. Uh, could your shoes, those very shoes, have been made of steel? Now notice I'm not asking could you have had a steel pair of shoes that was the same shape and size as these. Rather, could those shoes have been made of steel? And I think we would say no. If, if they were made of steel, it would be a different pair of shoes. It wouldn't be the same. Similarly with the universe. If the universe were composed of a different collection of quarks or fields, it would be a different universe. It wouldn't be the same. And that su suggests or shows, I think, the universe is contingent in its existence. It would be fantastic to think that every single fundamental quark and particle in the universe exists as a metaphysically necessary being. Uh, and scientists continually deal with universes that would be governed by different laws of nature. So it seems to me very, very plausible that the universe is contingent in its existence uh, and is not a metaphysically necessary being. So for that reason, I think the third premise is secure. Do you have any comments? So I take this to entail that uh, God could have decided not to create the universe. You're asking me? Could, am I saying that God could have not created? I'm asking, does it, uh, or, or you're asking the student? No, or? no, I'm asking you. I suppose the, your view then that the, the, the universe exists contingently. Yes. I suppose that on your view, God doesn't exist contingently. Correct. But given that the universe exists contingently, that God could have decided not to create the universe. Correct. Okay. No, it's, it, it was not an objection, I was just curious. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have another question over here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Preysen. In, in the course of debate, you say that we cannot prove that God exists or God doesn't exist. But I believe Bill have attempted to prove God exists. And you, in the end, say, I have not presented any argument that God doesn't exist. So how can I be a reasonable atheist? Well, well um, when I said that you can't prove that God exists and you can't prove that God doesn't exist, what I meant was proof in the logical, philosophical sense where proof means that you have a set of premises and then it deductively follow, and then a certain conclusion deductively follows from that. I don't think there's a reasonable set of premises which is sort of reasonably compelling to everyone such that the conclusion that God exists follows. And I don't think there's a set of premises such that the conclusion that God doesn't exist follows. Um, so, but what I said is that the way, of, the way to be a reasonable atheist is to treat the hypothesis that God exists as a hypothesis about how the world is. To treat it that way. And if we treat it that way and subject it to the sort of usual standards of thinking about what there might be in the world, then I don't think it's a very uh, compelling hypothesis. I, think, I don't think we have very compelling to reason to say that apart from the, in addition to the world as we know, it, all the properties that we know, then there's also this very, very strange and completely different entity I don't think the reasons are, are very compelling. It's, it's, it's right that, that, that Quake has, has, has said that there are, so, there are reasons of this sort. He's said that reasons of this sort. I don't think they are compelling. He keeps saying they are compelling. I keep being very unconvinced that they're very compelling. And I sort of suggest why, and he then says, well, they are compelling. 
So you have his word for them being very compelling, and you have my word for them being not very compelling. <laughs> now, I don't think I've ever used the word compelling tonight. I, I didn't say that atheists are irrational. No, I just no, no, think that there are good arguments for theism that meet the desiderata of yeah. Dr. Okay, but you keep saying they're good arguments. I keep saying they're not good arguments. Yes, of course you don't, but then you need to show why. You need to identify yeah. which premise is and false have, and, I have, and I have, why. I have, I have in, a, in, a, in a general sense, I've, I've pointed to some of the premises and about the other premises I've said, well, take my word for it, these premises are quite controversial in, in the philosophical community. Yeah, now we we're not going to, to take very, your word for it. <laughs> Now, I hear this. I'm uh, supposed to get a chance here now, right, yeah, to yeah. respond. So let, let me respond to the question. Um, Dr. Koppel, as we said, says that in order to provide evidence for a position, you can either give philosophical arguments, inference to the best explanation, or testimonial evidence. And so what we want to ask is, why should we believe atheism is true? What justification of any of those sorts is there for atheism? and we just haven't heard it. We're, we're looking for how can I be a reasonable atheist? What, what grounds or justification is there for it? Now, I agree, we can treat God exists as a hypothesis about the world, and my burden has been to show that the God hypothesis is very rich in explanatory power. Uh, it explains a wide range of the data of human experience, moral values, consciousness, uh, the origin of the universe, why something exists rather than nothing, the fine-tuning of the universe, the historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. This is an explanatory hypothesis that covers a wide range of the data of human experience, and therefore it seems to me to be perfectly rational to hold to. Thank you very much. Do we have another question for Professor Craig. Dr. Craig, my name is Nissan. Uh, in the cosmological argument and also the argument from the um, beginning of the universe that you brought forward, uh, they depend on the proposition that abstract entities like numbers cannot stand in causal or explanatory relations to physical events. Uh, but what would you say to the proposition that the um, abstract laws of arithmetic can stand in explanatory and causal relationship to the physical workings of a pocket calculator multiplying two of, numbers. Of what? A pocket calculator multiplying two numbers. All right. Um, the laws of nature, if they exist, would be propositions or mathematical equations of a certain form, and therefore would be abstract objects that exist beyond time and space. And they have no causal connection with anything. So the laws of nature are simply propositional descriptions of the way things in the universe operate, like, say, a pocket calculator. But the laws of nature don't cause the pocket calculator to work in a certain way. They're, it's simply misconceived to think that there's a causal relationship between these abstract propositional objects and physical things in the world. So I would say the laws of nature do not cause things to happen. They simply are accurate descriptions of the way the things in the universe act and react in causal relations amongst themselves. They have certain causal powers and dispositions, and the laws of nature are just true descriptions of this. But the laws of nature don't cause anything. They're just abstractions, and as such, don't have any causal power. Well, I think I agree about your skepticism about whether laws of nature conceived as, as propositions or mathematical equations don't have causal relations, don't stand in causal relations. Um, I agree about that, but um, I sort of keep wondering, why is it that you think, oh, I'm sorry, I'm now sort of again asking a, a question to you. <laughs> so one, one, one thing I've, I, I don't think I even begin to understand is how is it that a bodily mind sorry, that a bodyless mind causes the universe to exist. I mean, what's, what's the kind of causal relation? What's, what's the mechanics of that? I mean, try to imagine it. You have a mind, no body around. 
And then this mind, by a, an act of will, causes the... Yeah. And this is the explanation. And we are now told that this is a better explanation than saying it just happens randomly. Why is it better? It seems to be explain the mysterious by something which is vastly more mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting question, so I'll make an exception here and give oh. you another minute to explain that. I think that God's actions in the world are the analog to what we call basic actions that we do in our own bodies. When I will to lift my arm, I have a conscious volition and I will to lift my arm. Uh, and God's actions in the world would be like the basic actions which a mind uh, produces in its body. Um, so that's why I think Moreland's book on consciousness and the existence of God is so helpful because as a substance dualist, he believes that minds are mental or spiritual substances that are endowed with causal powers. And to ask what is the mechanics or the linkage between the two is to deny precisely this idea of a basic action. It, it's to look for some kind of a physical linkage which isn't there, that is to assume the wrong sort of model for uh, mental causation. And notice if you deny this type of causation, then what that means is we have no freedom of the will, we have no causal effects in our bodies from our minds or volitions. Uh, causation would be an entirely one-way street, uh, and I think that that's not a plausible model of human persons. Thank you. My name is Leif Eschmark Jensen. Um, I was a little surprised uh, when you suddenly in the debates uh, start questioning if, is this debate at all important? I've never been to a debate where some of the debaters start questioning if a topic is important or not. Uh, <laughs> so I actually question, uh, can you give like, some examples of what you consider important in your life and then give us a reason why is that important at all? Well... I think, uh, here's some important questions. Um, should we do more to relieve suffering in the third world? Should we, how, in, in what way can our lives be said to be meaningful, to have a meaning? Uh, in what way is uh, morality binding? Why should we be moral beings? These are important questions. Of course, you might then say, well, the question of God links to all these questions. But actually, that's, that, that's one of the things I find really puzzling. I mean, hearing this explanation about how the world came about, why exactly does it show that morality is binding? That you ought to be a moral person? I mean, you hear this story about how the universe was created six billion years ago by a bodiless mind that created an act of will. Why does that show that you ought to be a moral being? There's large number of steps missing here. As we all, maybe, maybe you have, a, have, an, have an explanation, but you know, I mean, I, I think that the question of why we ought to be moral beings is, is a very, very important one and has been discussed immensely in philosophy. Most philosophers who have discussed that question since Kant and before that have not resorted to the traditional view of saying that we ought to be moral beings because God has laid down the moral rules and he'll punish us if we are not moral beings. That's, that's tradi one traditional answer, of course, but it's, it's, it's an answer which uh, most philosophers have, have, have not accepted, though, of course, some have, so it's a matter of contra controversy. But these are important questions, yeah. yeah. So, the, uh, so why do you think they're important? Why do you think it's important to minimize suffering in the third world? Why do you think it's important to have moral issues, why? Well, now you're sort of imputing things I didn't say. I, I said it's an important question whether we should do it. Because, you know, don't you think so? I mean, don't you think that's an important question? I'm asking, I'm asking you, you. I think it's important because, um, well, I think human suffering and human happiness is important. If you're asking, so, if you're asking me to give a kind of presuppositionless argument that terminates in the conclusion that human suffering is important, then I think that, that's actually pretty difficult. So I'm very convinced that human suffering is important, but it's hard to come up with a non-question begging argument that human suffering is important. And now you're smiling because now I need God. Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think this is a genuine philosophical issue that we ought to think about. And when we think about it, seriously, then, I mean, 
I, I, I don't find myself consoled by trying to address that very important problem by simply saying there's, a, there's this very obscure being that is explaining all this. Thank you. Anybody who doesn't think that the question of the existence of God is important, I think needs to take a heavy dose of French existentialist philosophy. Read the atheist French philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, who thought that in the absence of God, life is absurd, without meaning, value, or purpose. I have never read a more poignant description of the human predicament than in the writings of authors like these. Or Friedrich Nietzsche, the 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God and uh, predicted an, an, the advent of nihilism once this realization was uh, widespread. I think these authors provide a very, very uh, gripping analysis of the human predicament in the absence of God, and therefore it's just absolutely vital that each of us think hard about this question, because every day we wake up, we answer by how we live, whether or not we think objective moral values exist, there's meaning in life, there's purpose to my existence, and so forth. These questions are unavoidable. Thank you. And do we have another question over here? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I'm Morten. And um, yes, you just said that um, the question of uh, whether God exists is an important yeah, one. Could you tip that oh, down? sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, and an essential one. And I fail to see that. So could I need you, you to enunciate a little more clearly. Okay. So I fail to see. Why is the question whether God exists an important or essential question? Could you give a dumbed-down version of uh, why is that? Yeah, yes. Uh, why is it important? Well, because let's, let's assume that the God of Christian theism exists. That means that there is a creator of the universe who loves you, who is absolute goodness, and who wants to bring you into a relationship with himself forever an inexhaustible, incommensurable good. It would be the fulfillment of human existence. It means there's a purpose for which you were created. God has a purpose for you to fulfill in this life. And it means that human beings are intrinsically morally valuable and that you have moral obligations to fulfill, such as loving your neighbor as yourself uh, and uh, helping to alleviate human suffering. Um, so there are profound implications if this is true. Now, on the other hand, if atheism is true, then it's very hard to see why there's any purpose in life. On atheism, the universe is destined to extinction in the heat death of the universe. As the universe expands, all the stars and the galaxies will burn out and matter will degenerate into black holes and dead stars. There will be no light, there will be no life, there will be no heat, only the corpses of dead stars and galaxies expanding into the endless night. It will be a universe in ruins. There is no purpose for which the universe exists, no purpose for which you exist. Moreover, there's no meaning to your life, ultimately. It doesn't matter what you do, because whatever you do will all end up the same in extinction. And it's hard to see on naturalism why there would be any objective moral values, why people would have intrinsic value. We're just basically relatively advanced primates which have evolved on this speck of solar dust called planet Earth. And it's hard to see why you would have an obligation to love other primates of your species or to do them good or not to act in your self-interest in certain cases. So these lead to just radically different views of how you will live your life depending on whether or not God exists. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, can I make a comment? Yes, you can. It's fine with you. Okay, you can, you can make okay. a short comment. Thank you. Yes. Um, your argument is you're appealing to uh, feelings, right? No. You, no. You, uh, goodness well, sake. Okay, okay. Can I, can I continue? Uh, how, is, uh, how is talking about the heat death mm, of the universe mm -hmm. and the it's, extinction it's, of the human race uh, so. uh, uh, appeal to feelings? That's a scientific fact about how things are going to end up. I, that's, I believe that. Um, what I meant was that I fail to follow your argument because I don't... I think that I should feel a void inside me if 
God doesn't, doesn't exist. You, you should what? Feel a void inside of me. Well, feel. now that's an appeal to feelings. You're the one appealing to feelings, mm. not me. I'm... You, you yes, should yes, feel a okay, void I'm, and you I'm, don't. I'm, sorry? You, you say you should feel a void and you apparently don't. I, I don't because, well, yeah. what if there's nobody loving me? Well, most of the time I love me and if I don't, then my family does and my friends. So I don't see the necessity for God through that. Uh, I, I would, well, uh, I should feel that there's a need for God. That, and that I, it seems to be your argument. I don't know. I mean, Nietzsche Can said I? that people may not feel the need for God because they can render themselves oblivious to this. Pascal said the same thing by occupying ourselves with activities and entertainment. We don't think of the, the absurdity of life and the meaninglessness that surrounds us. I, I think it takes serious philosophical reflection on these matters to, to realize them and the mass of humanity uh, often don't pause to seriously think about the implications if there is no God or if there is a God. But they're, they're vastly different as I think I illustrated. And so whether you feel a void or not is more a matter of your personal psychology than whether or not these worldviews have drastically different implications for human beings. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, I'd like to comment on it. I mean, so the question is, why is the, why is the question whether God exists important at all? And one view that explains why it's important is if you think that the existence of God explains that there's a meaning to life, that morality exists, objective morality exists, you really ought to be moral, that there's an afterlife and all that. So if you assume a, a number of things about God, then that will also explain why the question about God is, is important. That's fine. But then in, in, in your comments, uh, uh, Craig, you, you also said that, uh, if you, that it also goes the other way, that if you, if you don't assume that God exists, then you can't explain meaning of life. You can't explain morality. And, and, so, and, and the whole <coughs> thing becomes a kind of sort of existentialist nightmare. I don't agree about that at all. I mean, there's, there's a long-standing project in philosophy to explain morality, for one thing, or that, that's, that's pro probably the primary thing that people have been pre preoccupied with, explaining morality without appealing to God. Kant, for example, was a firm believer in God, but he had this very interesting project of explaining morality without appealing to God. And uh, you know, uh, this is controversial whether Kant succeeds in this, but, it, but, but it's, it's just one of many, many projects. And the, 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 the sort of brisk idea that without God we can't explain these things, that's just not true. I mean, it's, it's up in the air. Thank you. Do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, my name is Peter. I'm from Copenhagen, from Kirchen Kulturcenter. And Mr. Kepler, I have a question for you. Um, you have consistently this night uh, put Christianity in the same bracket as the ten thousands of other religions, even uh, the Nordic ones with Thor and the other crazy party gods. So my question to you is now that, uh, that we have been talking about the Jews actually seriously discussing with each other all of these supernatural events that occurred at Jesus' time, like the resurrections and the miracles and all of these things. Um, and if you look at the historical evidence for these discussions, it's pretty vast. And uh, if we were to disregard them as pure gibberish, we would in the same breathing also have to discard events like Caesar, because it is actually like Caesar. Um, if you use the same methods disregarding these uh, discussions, we would also have to disregard Caesar, because it's so well documented. So now that we know this, my question to you is, do you then believe that this actually deserves to be um, regarded as a good argument for putting Christianity in another bracket than all of the other 10,000s of religions? Um, and if you don't, would you please elaborate why? Um, I don't deny uh, that Jesus existed. I th as far as I'm told, I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, uh, but uh, as, far as, I'm, as far as I'm told, there's solid historical evidence that Jesus existed. But the evidence that he was God's son is less solid. I mean, he claimed so, other people claimed so, but you know, solid evidence for this was, was less solid. And um, that's the chill line I would take. Uh, 
I mean, it's a, there were certain supernatural phenomena being reported. Well, the, the reports are there, no doubt. Were they true? Is the best explanation of these reports, the occurrence of these reports, is the best explanation that, that this actually happened, or is there some other explanation? Uh, we are getting close to an end, but it's a very short yeah, okay, one. But, but, okay, let, let me come, uh, compare to CESA. I don't question at all that CESA existed, but suppose that there was a, a sort of reported supernatural event about CESA. I would be a bit skeptical about whether that actually happened. Well, the thing is that now it's actually the Jews who were the most eager people to prove that Jesus was an imposter and a fraud. Uh, a fraud. And since these people who are actually so eager to, to prove him yeah, wrong, they were discussing the supernatural things as if they actually happened. That is when it becomes peculiar. And that's why I'm asking, do you then think that Christianity deserves to be put in another bracket than all of the other religions? And if not, could you elaborate? I think the basic reason why Christianity evolved and, uh, and gained such a great following, the, the naturalistic sociological explanations of why this happened. That's what I think, yeah. But if, of course, do, do you want me to sort of elaborate the precise sociological, historical explanations of why this religion or this person with these followers gained such a prominence rather than all the many other people who were around in that area at that time? Why, 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 didn't, why didn't they sort of get a great crowd? I don't know the details of that, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that there is a naturalistic explanation of why that happened. Okay, thank you. And you um, I guess I would just simply say that Christianity is, I think, set apart from most of the other religions of the world and that it's not just a code of ethics or a, a, a system of religion about various gods and deities, but it's a religion that is rooted in history, in real historical events and people and places that you can read about in other ancient historical texts that we have archaeological confirmation of. You can read about people like Pontius Pilate, John the Baptist, James, Jesus' younger brother, in the works of Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian. We have archaeological evidences for the places described in the New Testament. This is not some sort of myth about a fairy land. This is about real people that actually lived, real places that actually existed, real events that actually took place. And as I say, that includes those three facts that crucially undergird the inference to Jesus' resurrection. So I think this does help to set Christianity apart. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank both of you for this very interesting debate. And also, I want to thank you for all your wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.